morning, everyone, and welcome to the CBI at 10. Uh, hard to believe, but the long month of January is over. It's February, um, uh, a short but potentially a long and busy month too. Um, we're delighted and really uh, grateful that Professor Linda Bold has joined us this morning and Simon Ross, uh, Ross Bertram, who's a partner at Evershades. We want to spend the bulk of this morning's conversation talking about the public health issues around the vaccine and then employer responsibilities around the vaccine and so i know many people have joined for that reason uh, as ever the aim of this call is that we share expertise and also experience on the ground please weigh in with your experience with your with your points of view and the questions in the chat um, but we're joined too by tony danker the director general of the cbi and Tony, this, if everyone's okay, I'd like to just park vaccines for five, ten minutes because I know it's the start of Race Equality Week. There's quite a lot moving on Brexit. I know there's the questions people are having about business in the NHS. I'd like to talk a little about that. I also saw many people have seen that you've written a letter to the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng. And do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Because I think companies are beginning to think about what the emergence from lockdown might look like so can we start there and just hear, hear a little yeah we can sure good morning everybody so uh i think i said last week that one of the things that we were becoming concerned with was the need for a roadmap for businesses to understand how how things might play out uh we'd reach sort of peak confusion i called it last monday in terms of i think business leaders felt completely paralyzed from doing anything from making any kind of decisions because they didn't really know anything at all about how things might open up and what that might mean in real workplace situations and so on friday i wrote a letter to quasi uh, quasi the business secretary i spoke to him as well about it to say, look, I really think there's an opportunity for what you might call the economic policy makers, so not the health ones, who are absolutely rightly focused, along with the Prime Minister and Number 10, on containing the virus. But for the economic policy makers, you know, those in the Treasury and in Bayes and other government departments, and people like us, by the way, to start doing the plan for reopening. And I don't mean the stuff the Prime Minister is going to do with the scientists about when we can move out of lockdown or, you know, uh, corresponding the opening of the economy to the R rate. I mean, the real practical workplace solutions, including vaccination and its role, uh, can we start to think about that now so that we are ready to help businesses understand how this will play out? And if you'll just indulge me for a second, I'll tell you the six areas that we raised in particular for him to look at. Uh, Firstly, to confirm what we're going to see as low, medium or high risk activity so that we can just restate for businesses whether or not the same principles will be used as last time. What does that mean for COVID safe workplaces and so on? Uh, secondly, deciding whether or not there'll be a return to tiering, uh, which, of course, uh, the prime minister will do. Uh, and if so, you know, do we know anything about whether or not the tiers will be like last time or do we know roughly the kinds of workplace scenarios, commercial scenarios that will be allowed under certain tiers? Uh, thirdly, uh, identifying and understanding the conditions that need to be met before rolling back certain restrictions. So one of the most important things we learned in 2020 was that businesses really had no visibility about what could get you out of a certain tiering or how you could reopen various parts of your workplace. Can we give a bit more certainty on that? Uh, fourthly, and this comes on to this, today's discussion, outlining how the vaccine will be uh, rolled out in phase two. Uh, and in particular, we, the CBR, are of a strong view that you need to focus, first of all, on the enablers of economic reopening. So these are things like teachers and transportation, because as we learned in the first lockdown, schools closing is an economic issue because obviously the amount of homeschooling takes away from the workforce and so on. Uh, five, and this will be a really big one, is thinking about how regular mass testing becomes part of workplace life. We had Dido on last week. And I, I think one of the most interesting things that came from the Dido conversation was that even when we have vaccinated, and Linda might want to come on to this, even when we have vaccinated, we're still going to need a workplace testing regime uh, to understand transmission and to keep an eye out for new variants. So businesses have millions of questions about workplace testing. And then finally, uh, can we think about uh, detailed sectors of the economy which are obviously going to be specifically hit? So that might include airlines and aviation, obviously. You know, we're, we're starting to discuss now a regime to reopen uh, the aviation sector, not only with 
pre-departure testing, but also what could we do in terms of quarantine release or at airport testing as well. And things like the event sector, you know, is there, uh, is there a pathway for the event sector to get back sooner than right at the end? And if so, what might that look like? So taken all together, James, I think there's a lot of granular stuff we could be doing now, uh, and hopefully Quasi, uh, Quasi and the base team will take the lead on this. Uh, in order to start giving some visibility and in order to raise now the questions that, by the way, businesses are already talking about. They're already talking about these things and they're talking in a vacuum. So that's one of the big things we're trying to drive with uh, with Quasi this week. Very happy to take a few questions on that before I move on to what else is going on. Yeah, Tony, can we just do a couple of things? I mean, the one is, I think you're right about confusion and combined with weariness, there's a sort of you know, there's, a, there's this frustration, isn't there, people not being able to see what happens next. The biggest issue I imagine here is around your point six, sectoral support. You know, the Treasury has been very reluctant to deliver sectoral support. What's your read on the willingness to think about that now, given the fact that there are going to be different sectors that open at different times? Yeah, look, I, I think the general principle has to be that we taper financial support to the reality of the restrictions. Those two go hand in hand. You know, we, we wouldn't have financial support if we didn't have restrictions. Therefore, if we maintain restrictions, we have to maintain financial support. That's the principle, to protect the viability of firms, to create the bridge to the other side. And so we've said a couple of things in our budget submission, and I'll be seeing the Chancellor this month to discuss them. The first one is, uh, can we extend uh, it's clear that the virus uh, uh, and this third wave has extended everybody's timelines. I think government are yet to explicitly acknowledge that in terms of economic support, but surely they will do so. So can we, first of all, extend all those cliff edges of financial support beyond April to, let's say, June? Secondly, can we not uh, just go from overnight full support to overnight no support when the economy is not going to reopen that way? Instead, can we taper support and target support accordingly? So you're right, that may turn out, James, to be about sectors. It might turn out to be scale of support. So rather than having overnight, you know, go from 100% to zero, having much more of a sort of, uh, of a landing path for support, or it might be targeted support to those sectors specifically hit by the economy. It, uh, I, look, I understand why the Treasury don't like doing that. It's incredibly complicated. It's an administrative burden. It's a classification burden. But I think if you agree with that principle that you need to taper support uh, according to restrictions, then yes, I think we're going to have to look at what the new restrictions will be. And the Chancellor will again, as he's been throughout the crisis, have to be agile about how to essentially marry those two principles at once. And Tony, one other thing, the second point in the letter about tiering, are you raising something that we haven't really thought of? I know there are people beginning to say, look, we should actually open nationally and not go back to regional tiers. We should tier around certain activities, certain places. Is that what you're driving at? Or is it more the fact that you think there will be tiering, but to refine the system? Well, look, first of all, a few things about this letter. Number one, this, uh, our, our request for a plan is entirely date neutral. It comes down to the prime minister using SAGE and other advice about when we can do any of the above. Secondly, I think it's likely that the prime minister and the COVID task force will make decisions about what tiers are and whether or not they'll be regional or sectoral. But I think we are saying yes, that actually, can we have a bit more specificity about within various tiers, what it means for various sectors. And that can, can that be based on the latest thinking about what we know about COVID safe operations? And by the way, some of this might just be restatement, but I think we've got ourselves to a place now where actually most business leaders and business owners think, I actually have no idea what happens next. By the way, I'm not sure that they're all protesting that we must reopen the economy tomorrow. They get the seriousness of, uh, of bringing the crisis under control. But I think they're, they almost feel paralyzed from making decisions. And that's not good for the economy. And it might not be necessary. It may well be we can have enough granularity and enough of a roadmap to make people think, OK, I can see that over the course of the year, this gets better. I can anticipate now what I need to be doing, including, by the way, on workplace testing. I need to get onto this. I need to get on top of it. I need to find a supplier. I need to consult employees. There's a lot people could be doing to put them on the front foot for the year ahead 
uh, rather than just literally waiting uh, and watching the news to see what that might mean for them. All right, well, we're going to get into definitely into point four, into vaccine rollouts and enablers in a moment with, with Linda and Simon. So, should we just touch on some of the other things that are on the agenda for the CBI this week? Sure. Well, just to say, first of all, it's Race Equality Week this week. Uh, and if you haven't heard of it, you can you can basically search Race Equality uh, Week and you as a company can uh, sign up to the campaign and you can get access to resources. Uh, the theme this year is transparency and accountability. The week runs to the 7th of February. Uh, we're doing a lot at the CBI. We could always be doing more, but uh, we've got our own uh, Bain network uh, um, amongst our staff in order to make sure that we're focusing on uh, ethnicity related issues at work. Uh, we, we publish our ethnicity pay gap alongside the gender pay gap. Uh, we've got a full internal action plan that deals with recruitment and progression of Bain staff. Uh, we've just agreed that we're going to support the 10,000 black in Turns program, which will kick in in July. And of course, as you know, we have changed the race ratio, which is our attempt to have uh, far higher and far more proportionate uh, race representation at boards across the country. And that's gaining real speed. So I just wanted to bring to everybody's attention Race Equality Week. And again, you can sign up as a business for the campaign. You get a ton of resources and, and great ideas about what to do in the week. That's number one. Number two, uh, I think I mentioned last week, uh, a, uh, the, the feedback from Matt Hancock around business playing a real role in supporting the NHS, NHS and social care workers really, really, really feeling strain. It's front of mind for the business, uh, for the health secretary and his team. Uh, and so just a reminder, we have a new hashtag for our campaign, hashtag business backing NHS. Three things you can do, and Alison, our team will put uh, in, in the chat some of the websites, uh, offer discounts to NHS and social care staff. Uh, get involved in local uh, in supporting your local hospital or vaccination centre, and above all, allowing staff the time uh, to either volunteer or themselves to go and get vaccinated. That's how you can uh, help alleviate some of the issues. Uh, two more issues. One just on testing, workplace testing. I'm sure we'll come on to. We did a survey last week, which we published this weekend, about businesses and the uptake of workplace testing. Uh, our survey, our survey found that 87% of firms are not testing. By the way, 13% of firms are testing. 32% uh, of firms are doing it because they are not doing it because they feel they lack the expertise of the guidance. But the government has just published guidance and a scheme to help firms that want to do uh, asymptomatic testing in the workplace. Uh, and again, we'll put an email uh, in the chat if you want to find out more about what you can do. And then uh, you'll be delighted to hear I'm not going to talk about Brexit, uh, but we are going to do it on Wednesday. So just to let people know, uh, Jess Glover, who's the director general uh, at the cabinet office who runs our Brexit task force, uh, chaired by Michael Globe with, uh, Gove with us, she'll be on on Wednesday uh, with Sean McGuire, who runs uh, our Brussels office, has been at the CBI for 20 years and is a total expert uh, in all things European uh, and the Brussels perspective. So that's to look out to on Wednesday. Okay, Tony, thank you very much. We've got so much on, it's unbelievable. Um, let, let's get ourselves stuck into the conversation about vaccines, because that is, you know, it's leading the news, it's it's dominating people's thinking. Um, Linda Bolt, Professor Bolt, you're, you know, you're a professor of public health. It's strange, isn't it? One of the things that uh, has transformed in this pandemic is our absolute fascination with the way in which public health actually can direct and transform our behavior. But before I turn to Simon and just think a little bit about businesses, responsibilities and liabilities, what are you most worried about in terms of the rollout of this vaccine and the way in which businesses can be helping to bring it to the attention of their employees, making sure that the vaccine reaches as many people as possible? Thanks very much, James. Yeah, so if I maybe just say a few words about where we are and then I'll move on to the vaccines issue. And then later on, as Tony said, I'm happy to talk about workplace testing as well, because that's something obviously we're thinking about for universities and labs. So it's uh, it's very relevant and we're heavily involved in discussions on that. And we're, you know, we're right, the first thing to emphasize from a public health perspective is we really are making progress. You know, we've come through a, a horrific period in terms of uh, the incidence and prevalence of the disease. Um, as you're rightly pointing out, the NHS is still under huge strain, much worse than it was in the first wave in the spring. Um, but you can see that hospital admissions and even ICU admissions are starting to decline. So we're going to um, see real progress in the next few weeks. And I would be relatively confident that we will see some easing 
of these restrictions, but very gradually because governments are very risk averse now around the UK because they've learned from previous, I think, you know, systems issues that were perhaps not dealt with. In terms of the vaccines, that is the good news story. If you put it internationally, the UK is making incredible progress. There are only two other countries globally, Israel and the, universe, and, and the United Arab Emirates that are ahead of us in terms of vaccinating with first dose our population. And you will have seen um, that we've already provided almost 9 million first doses. So it is really, really good progress. What am I worried about there? I think a number of things. When we're in this much older age group, nursing homes, over 80s, etc., and even into a, a little bit younger than that, employers are not don't have the biggest role to play. But as we get into the younger uh, groups, employers have a huge role to play. But they also have a role to play now with, with uh, their employees who may be vulnerable or may have underlying health conditions and are now eligible for vaccination. So my biggest concern about the vaccine programme um, I think is about ongoing supply and the logistics of it. But my second biggest concern is about inequalities in uptake. And inequalities in uptake, mm -hmm. uptake Will, de will directly affect our ability to recover from this crisis. And um, because we need herd immunity, and the only way to get herd immunity is through vaccination, not all the other stuff we've talked about in the past. Um, and so we do need the, the, the groups who are not um, having equal access or are hesitant. And you can see even from those that have been vaccinated already, there are inequalities. Uh, a study published last week of the first um, over 100,000 people who got the vaccine shows those inequalities by ethnicity and also by deprivation. And that includes for many employers, staff who may be in particular occupational groups um, will be less likely to have access. So these are the things I'm thinking about at the moment. Thanks. And, and Linda, can I ask you about that? I'm reminded of our naivety back in March. You know, we were all talking about the pandemic as the great leveler uh, democratic disease and then the course of the year realizing how much, how cruelly it affected some people much more than others on the vaccine do you feel as though you've got the data that's giving you sufficient clarity about priority distribution supply so you know where as the vaccine rolls out through younger cohorts who's getting it and who's not well, from an epidemiological perspective, we've got amazing data sets that give us very rapid feedback on where the gaps are. So I would be confident we'll know who's getting it and who's not getting it. I'm not confident about knowing about supply because the UK government's been very clear that they don't want too much publicly available information about supply mm -hmm. to be released. You'll remember the disagreement between the Scottish government and the UK government when the Scottish government published their vaccine plan with some of that detail in it. So. That's a gray area for those of us working in public health is not something we can control. But in terms of interrogating and of course then challenging government and the NHS mm. on um, who's not taking it up or um, not receiving it, we can do that. Just one other final point, sort of anti-vax, people who have anti-vax sentiments are a tiny proportion of our population. There's a much bigger group who are hesitant about vaccines, which is something completely different. They have, genuine questions. I think employers and others can help to point them in the direction of, um, you know, reliable, evidence-based information that can answer those questions. And, and Lynn, I'm going to come to Simon in one moment. Can I just ask you, though, about even vaccine hesitancy? Is it the case that vaccine hesitancy is not a national problem, i.e. that the vast majority of the population will take up the vaccine, but it is a communal problem? i.e. in certain places among certain groups of people, vaccine hesitancy rises significantly. Is, are you seeing any evidence of that? Yes, so um, my own previous work has been primarily in non-communicable diseases, so cancer. And if you look at things like HPV vaccination, it definitely is an issue that clusters in groups. And we're seeing that here as well. Now, just to start with the good news briefly, the UK has more confidence in vaccination than most other countries in the world. You see that from the big World Economic Forum, Ipsos Mori polling, even from last week. Only Brazil is ahead of us in willingness to get vaccinated. But there are groups, and this is a, an issue around uh, particular ethnic minority groups, but also, also people living or working in particular occupational groups, as I say, less affluent um, communities who, by discussing these issues amongst themselves, have common concerns. So it is an issue about groups in the population. Um, and, and you see that with vaccine hesitancy. And that's why it's important that we have employers and community leaders from those groups speaking to them about the importance of vaccines.
Okay, Linda, thank you. I, I'm gonna, I definitely will come back to you on workplace testing. I also would love to come back to you on the issue of transmission, because I think that's a big issue around hesitancy and, and uptake of the vaccine. But, but Simon, um, Linda began to talk about how employees and businesses respond to the vaccination programme. Can I start by asking you just actually as guidance for companies, what you think they should be doing in terms of freeing up employees to go, requiring employees to go, mandating customers vis-a-vis -vis vaccination? What's your thinking around all this? Well, thank you, James. We think that employers should uh, play a role here and essentially give the information that is available to staff to make an informed decision and then ultimately to support them in the decision they make even if that is a decision that they decide not to be vaccinated uh, i just the nhs uh, themselves have adopted the approach of uh, the words strong encouragement so that all nhs frontline workers have been strongly encouraged to take up the vaccine and of course uh, if that's good enough for the NHS, then our starting point is that would be good enough for most employers. Yeah. And, and Simon, what about no jab, no job? Can we get into this question? Oh, a, yeah. is that legal? Um, well, obviously, the individual circumstances of each employer mean that it's a, it's, it's a private matter between an employer and each employee from a question of contract um, but legally the problem is there's no real justification for mandation of vaccination that is the ultimate problem and what are employers going to do if employees don't get jabbed are they going to fire people well it's certain that that would lead to unfair dismissal i'm sure but the, the slighter softer approach slightly softer approach of course would be to prevent people who haven't been jabbed attending the workplace it doesn't involve termination but even that we think is riddled with difficulty because of course people are told don't come to work because you haven't been jabbed then the question comes well are they going to be paid because if if they're going to sit at home and not be dismissed then there's a question of pay and basically the, the law is clear that pay will be due if employees are ready willing and able to work and it's our our view would be that if they're told you can't come to work unless you've been jabbed then that would be the employer's choice uh, and that would then leave the employee in a position where they can't attend work and it's the employer's fault so pay would be due so even if we adopted the more measured approach if it, even if an employer adopted the more measured approach of not terminating people but essentially causing them not to attend work we believe they're going to end up paying them anyway so it's just it's just a bad route. No jab, no job. It's just a bad approach. Okay. And, and Simon, and this is gets. Uh, I'm sorry. I know that as a lawyer, you get rolled into often what are not actually legal issues, but more sort of ethical and social and cultural. Yeah. Ones. So forgive me. I'm going to do that anymore. One of the questions is also about customers, right? So you so you begin to see it in the aviation industry. People saying you're not going to be allowed on a plane unless you've got evidence of a jab there's people beginning to ask that question in the hospitality sector too and in the live event sector is there any way that that is either legal or enforceable certainly all circumstances will be taken into account if these issues ever got to an employment tribunal and third party pressure as somebody like me would call it is a recognized consideration that will affect whether an employer's overall behavior is seen as fair or not so yes clearly if numbers of third parties including customers are insisting that employers behave in certain ways that will influence the debate i'm not sure at the moment given what we're going to come back to about transmission for example we don't even know whether or not transmission is massively assisted uh, i think that right. I, I think as it as it as it as the debate moves forward these things will become more clear. But at the moment, I wouldn't think that third party pressure would justify an employer insisting that employees become vaccinated. No, my, mine is actually about whether or not customers, that, that businesses can insist that their customers, i.e. passengers oh. on planes, uh, people who visit 
you know, pubs, restaurants, live well, events sorry, have sorry, to have a yeah, vaccination. Sorry. That, that is, it, it, yeah, of course, the, the nature of the customer, uh, the customer relationship is a different one to the employment relationship. So I think it would be easier for, uh, for, for employers to mandate that customers are vaccinated. Certainly easier for that than it would be uh, in an employment environment. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm, thanks. I'm, I, Tony, can I just come back to the point that you flagged? The sort of point four in your letter to the business secretary, to Kwasi Kwarteng, was, if I, if, I, if I read it right, was we need to think in the next phase, phase two of the vaccination programme, who are the priority recipients of the vaccine? And do you, do you have a view on who they should be? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, obviously it's not our job. Uh, there's a committee that looks at that. But I, I think there, I detect a bit of a consensus uh, from those I speak to in government around thinking horizontally about uh, how to reopen the economy. So if you're going to think about the economy rather than necessarily sector picking in terms of vaccination, you think about the great enablers, which is you know, the most important enablers of the economy to get moving again are schools and transport. That's what we learned last time. Uh, and so I think you know, there's definitely an emergency workplace testing, workplace regime, reopening question when it comes, for example, to the aviation sector. You're absolutely right about that. We have a national emergency emerging uh, on the aviation sector. But I think in terms of vaccination, it will be guided by the government using uh, the, the relevant committee who's been looking at it. But we would urge, I think, that we think about horizontally how to maximize reopening of the economy. And that's about schools and it's about transportation. Okay, okay, Tony, thank you. Um, Linda, can I just come back to you on a couple of points? Firstly, Simon mentioned vaccinated people and transmission. Right? Can you just address what we do and don't know about that? And, and while you're at it, if I might, vaccinated people and infection. One of the things we're beginning to see is some evidence of people being infected with COVID-19, even if they're not hospitalized or become seriously ill. So, so understanding exactly what the efficacy of the vaccine is? Okay, so the first thing to say is we don't definitively know yet whether these vaccines, uh, particularly obviously the three vaccines that are being licensed for use in the UK, the Pfizer, BioNTech, AstraZeneca, Oxford and, and Moderna, can prevent somebody who's being, vaccin being vaccinated from trans transmitting the virus, picking up the virus and giving it to somebody else. We actually don't know that. There's a little bit of data from the AstraZeneca trials which suggests that transmissibility might be reduced if somebody's been vaccinated. And we're beginning to see some data from Israel as well that suggests that might be the case. So what the scientific community is hoping is that these vaccines will not just prevent severe disease, hospitalization and death, but they'll also play a role in reducing the risk of transmission. But we simply don't know that now. So we have to work on the basis that they don't. And that's why you know it's important that we think about testing and all these other things. Um, then you were asking me, can somebody? Um, I'm sorry. Is it and actually, sorry, Linda. What is, can, can I just pick up on this point? It reduces hospitalisation and death. This is sorry. This is a very ignorant question about vaccinations. I'd assume that vaccination stimulated the immune system so that it would repel the virus but it seems to be mitigating the virus, and I don't understand that. So what it's doing is a vaccine mounts an immune response, antibodies and T cells, which allow the virus, once it's entered your cells, not to make you very ill. In other words, not to invade your, your, your lots of different parts of your system that would produce symptoms which would then make you very unwell. It can't repel the virus from entering your body. So the way that most people are carrying this virus and passing it on to others is through the upper airways. So that's how if I sneeze or cough, I might give it to you. So you could still breathe in virus and be carrying it in your upper airways without that virus making you very unwell because you've got an antibody response against it. But if you cough on someone when you've picked it up, you might still be able, you know, you're, you're still a host, if that makes sense. Do, do, does, does, that, does that answer the question in a helpful way? Yeah. Yes, it does, because I think one of the things I wanted, the reason I want to discuss this issue about transmissibility and infection, Simon, was just come back to you, is there are a number of companies beginning to ask questions about if they do vaccinate their employees, 
does that change the COVID secure requirements? If your whole team is vaccinated, can you operate differently in the workplace? And I don't know whether you've seen any guidance on that. I haven't seen any guidance on it. Um, obviously, we all hope, don't we, to get to a position where at some stage COVID secure guidelines can be, can be uh, you know, released in work or, or at least reduced. Um, and it's a, I think it's a, just a question of how the vaccination program rolls out ultimately and how effective it is and how likely it is that uh, employees could still get ill in work and if the if the risk of that has diminished substantially then i think covid secure measures will diminish with it Linda, do you, is your understanding the exact same covid secure work requirements exist even in the event that the entire team in an environment is vaccinated Yeah, thanks. Um, no, I mean, the thing, the other thing to understand from a public health perspective is even if the virus doesn't protect against transmission, the virus needs hosts. And if everybody's been vaccinated, the, the, the chances of it being there in the environment, being picked up and passed on will reduce. You know, that's the, that's the main thing. And people won't become unwell with it. So you wouldn't need the same kind of COVID secure uh, workplace guidelines when most people or everybody has been vaccinated. Let's keep in mind these vaccines are not 100% effective, so there's, there's still some questions. But as you reduce the prevalence and incidence of the disease in the population through the measures we have now and vaccination, you can open things up. And I, now my view is that, you know, in the long term, we might be wearing face coverings like years from now in the winter because they look like they're a good idea to reduce influenza and other things. But I don't think the physical distancing we have now is going to be an indefinite thing because you know we will make progress in in this respect yeah so um linda can we just touch on the mass testing um yeah. uh totally right uh uh dino harding mentioned it last week what, what's your understanding of what businesses should expect through the course of 2021 on testing okay so i really can't emphasize enough the importance of this and i also can't emphasize and i'll say this in a very neutral way um, across the country, I think we've struggled to realize earlier in the pandemic and even now the importance of testing um, and, and currently asymptomatic testing. We're going to need to continue this because it's going to take months for the vaccine program to be rolled out. And even once it has been rolled out, there are questions about if we have new variants and we need booster vaccines, etc. So I think we need a fit for purpose testing infrastructure. I think what businesses need to do, and I'm just going to talk about universities for a moment because that's my sector, is we only have a small proportion of our students and staff on campus, primarily in the labs, and then the medical students that I teach who need practical uh, in training, and there are other groups like that as well. It's a small proportion. We're beginning to regularly test, as other universities have done, to allow us to have secure workplaces and to boost um, confidence amongst our students and staff that it's a safer place to work. So um, I think that uh, many employ employers should think about this. I think they should actively engage with government. Now, what you need is access to repeat testing because a test is only good as when it's delivered to the individual. We, were, we are looking at a model of twice a week. We're also looking at saliva testing. Um, we have an approach we're using now with PCR tests where you just spit into a tube because you don't want these invasive tests in the longer term. That's the second point. The third point is, Think carefully about what type of test. The lateral flow is not a perfect test at all. You will have seen all the stuff in the media about that. It may be that businesses need to be looking at PCR testing that's done in blocks. So you have many tests that are done at once. And there's lots of partners and companies that you know can be engaged with to look at this. But and I also think finally, probably for even mass events in the future, things like that, we may we may be looking at testing regimes that, that people have access. But in the short term, for workplaces, I think it's a key component uh, for the months to come. And, and Linda, just uh, for, for people who didn't join the call with Dino Harding last week, one of the things that was really interesting was Bayes' support for businesses that want to take up regular testing. Um, I think um, Alice Grimes from the CBI has kindly given the email address there, it was also interesting that there's going to be funding support potentially for companies that are that are seeking to do that. But can I just get absolutely clear, you're saying there are problems with a lateral flow test, but your view is 
repeat lateral flow tests is better than no testing or that PCR testing is, is the answer? So repeat lateral flow testing is definitely better than no testing because the key thing is repeat. Um, now, what lateral flows very briefly are good at doing is they're good at picking up really infectious people. People who have a high viral load, the lateral flow is likely to pick them up. They're not good at picking up people who might be infectious but are not terribly infectious. So that's a risk. You're going to miss cases. But if you're testing people twice a week, you'll miss far fewer cases. What I was saying, if you wanted a, an even more sensitive and specific system, you might look at mass PCR asymptomatic testing. And that the developments in that field are... are are speeding ahead all the time. The universities are looking at different approaches, but obviously, um, you know, Dido and colleagues can advise on that, but there'll be others local who can as well. Simon, can I ask you, what would you advise companies who are now beginning to think to themselves, all right, we need a vaccine strategy for the business, but how do they begin to, how do they, how do they go about setting that up? Well, I think the, the, the starting point should be engagement with, with employees. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical with employee representatives and trade unions where, where they exist so that people are carried along with the strategy from, from day one. Um, and, and I think that is absolutely fundamental. Um, as far as testing is concerned, just as a, a follow-on to the, to the last section, I have actually started to notice amongst the advice that I'm giving an uptake in employers wanting to introduce mandatory testing programs in workplaces. So I think, Tony, your figure earlier was 13%, wasn't it? I think it's, it's likely that that, um, that figure will shortly start to increase. And, and, and so I'm going to ask you, Kate Redshaw was with a question which is, which picks up on the point that Linda was making around vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, but speaks directly to employer responsibility. So uh, I'm going to read it. If the vaccine is shown to reduce transmission, to what extent does that change the position for the employer who wants to mandate the vaccine, i.e. with the argument that it reduces transmission to others, so it's the right thing to do to protect the health and safety of other employees in the workplace? It's a very, it's a very good question. And as things develop, it might become more of an argument to suggest that people should be vaccinated, particularly if it has a significant effect on transmission. But the other side of that equation is that if sufficient people in the workforce have voluntarily been vaccinated, then the ability for a non-vaccinated employee to harm those who have been vaccinated is by definition then reduced. And so, uh, so, and so I see perhaps different workplaces having different issues according to the risk and the scale of uptake of vaccination within that workplace. Right. And, and we, 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 we talked a little bit about no jab, no job. The, the, that, that's the, if you like, the, the legal side when you're requiring people to uh, vaccinate. Is there any liability on the other side? What's the extent of employee li employer liability in the event that their workplace is seen to be not COVID secure because they're allowing people to come to work who haven't had the vaccine. Yeah, but obviously the, the starting point is that employers have to keep workplaces safe. Um, but I would imagine that it would be difficult um, with the way this particular strain is so contagious. It seems to be, it's going to be difficult for any worker who becomes infected to be able to prove that they got infected in the workplace. It just seems, I don't know if, yeah. I'm not a scientist obviously, but it just seems to me that evidentially, it, I think it will be difficult for employees to start legal claims against employers suggesting that they got, um, they got infected at work. But I, I say I'm not a scientist, but that, that's my initial view. So, I think, so I'm like, we'll, 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 unfortunately we do have a public health expert, because so I want to finish by my, Linda, with you. On a question about policy for businesses and for government, which is one of the questions that the vaccine programme raises, is going to be what is our level of tolerance as a society for infection? I, at what level of you know, infection rate, hospitalisation, do we think we've got a new normal? Because that will be the level at which people can begin to think about the return to a quote unquote more normal economy. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's difficult. So earlier in the pandemic, there was this sort of idea that a thousand cases a day was an, you know, was was a level at which we could uh, not exactly be normal at all, but we could tolerate that. 
And I think uh, if you think about it, so I'm just looking at, so yesterday we had over 20,000 new cases. Um, if you look back to the summer when quite a lot of the economy was open, here in Scotland we had tiny numbers of cases a day. So I think you'll, you'll, you really need to get the, the number of cases down to a far, far lower level than they are, are now. Um, you need the R, it's probably more, it's better to perhaps talk about the R. The R really needs to be about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 for us to be in a comfortable position where most things are open again, I would think. Not most things, because there's some things we won't be able to do, but around about that level. So we've got a long way to go. But the point, James, you're raising is an important one. This virus will become endemic, not pandemic. It will become endemic in the, in the community. We will live with it and we will accept a tolerable le level of illness and hospitalization and potentially even some mortality in the future. I don't have numbers to give you for that and that's a government decision, but I would say in terms of cases, we need to get cases far lower than they are now. The R right now is between 0 0.7 and 1.1. So we need to push that range down significantly lower. And that's why I think in a month's time, uh, there will be some, I think, return to education. This is just a personal view. Uh, there might be a surprise that happens between now and then and in a couple of months time I think we will be in a different position around gradual easing. Also just to add the vaccine program is going to have an impact quite soon. I know you'll be hearing different things on this. In care homes we're going to see I hope a dramatically reduced incidence of care home outbreaks literally in the next few weeks and far fewer yeah. deaths and then after that into the community. So I'm actually quite optimistic um, certainly for the months ahead. And then we need to worry about, you know, the autumn where things might get tricky again and international travel, which is a big risk if we can't deal with yes. that. Linda, Simon, th th thank you both so much. I'm just going to come back to Tony. Tony, if I can, for one, just one thought, which is, you know, in the spring, even early summer of last year, we spent a lot of time on these calls saying, let's start thinking about the post-COVID world now. Let's start thinking about how we build back better. It feels to me as though at the beginning of 2021, we're thinking much more about the with COVID world. Right? The post-COVID world is, it feels like a less realistic proposition for the next year or two. Does that change the way in which you think about longer term planning for businesses? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I think we need to walk and chew gum. I'm, I'm going to make a speech later this week about the next decade of our economy. Uh, and the reason I'm going to make that speech now, uh, despite the fact that people might say this is the wrong time, is that I think there's probably a consensus that after 2008, uh, we as a nation didn't really have a plan for the decade ahead. Uh, and it turned out to present problems. So I do think, particularly when there's been such a high level of solidarity and pretty good joint government and business planning together, I do think there is a bit of work to be done now, and I'll say a bit more about it later in the week, about the next decade ahead and how, from a point of view about uh, health, wealth, inclusivity, uh, some of the issues we've talked about today, we do need to start thinking about them. Don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't think the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary should be thinking about them, they should be thinking about the virus, but we will need to be thinking about them. But you're right about the year ahead. I mean, one of the most interesting parts of this conversation, which has been fascinating, is already I took away from some of Simon and Linda's comments, things we do know are going to be definitely true in workplaces this year, and things that we don't yet know. And I think that's the importance of getting this roadmap together. So my final appeal to everybody this week, we have an email address, which Alice will put in the chat, coronavirussupport at cbi.org.uk. Please email us the kinds of issues, granular workplace issues, like the ones we've just discussed today, that we can get a sounding on and help the business secretary and the government start to do planning now. I think the lesson from past crises is that there is nothing more important than the front line fighting the crisis. But for those of us that don't work in the NHS, for those of us that are in sort of economic policy roles or, or, or business strategy roles, we could be doing the work now to work out how these things can be rolled out over the course of the year so we can bounce back quickly. And I will be making a case later this week that we should think about the decade ahead too. We don't need a, a detailed plan. It's not the right time for that. But we need to have put some stakes in the ground about what we've learned from the crisis and how we're going to have a better decade than the last.
Okay, Tony, thank you very much. Simon Rice Birchall from Evershed, thank you. And Professor Linda Bolt from the University of Edinburgh, thank you too. Tony, it's ever good to talk to you. As, uh, as you said earlier, we're going to be back on Wednesday, CBI 10 to talk Brexit and other things. Um, have a good day and a very good week, everyone.